todaysrealtalk.com, todaysrealtalk.com, todaysrealtalk.com. I am Justin Kazepis with the honor and privilege of being joined today by Dr. Chu. Dr. Chu, how are you today, sir? Very good. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. I have this giant stack of papers here in front of me, and uh, it's not something I've written. Uh, This is actually all items you have written, sir. And what I'm doing here is I am going to what I believe, if I printed this properly... Hmm, I may not have. I have your CV here somewhere as well, and I was going to start listing your entire resume and all of your works that you have written and co-authored with people, but I'm going to be honest with you, Dr. Chu, I would start boring people at that point, and it's not because your content isn't thrilling. It's because I would not know how to deliver it. You use a lot of big words, sir. A lot of which that I, uh, going to be honest, even as an educated individual that I consider myself, don't know how to pronounce. And so I am hoping today you will help us break some concepts down. You're an economist. Yes. Yep. Tell us about your background. Tell us um, where you're from. What kind of food do you like to eat? No, you don't have to go into all that if you don't want to. But tell us, uh, tell us your background. Tell us a little bit about you and what makes Dr. Chu Dr. Chu. Um, so I'm uh, originally from China, grew up in a small town very close to Shanghai, and um, went to college um, uh, in Beijing and graduated college in 2002 with a uh, degree in urban planning. And uh, then I went on to Singapore, National University of Singapore to pursue my master degree. Master is in uh, real estate and got my degree there in 2004 and then uh, continued to get my PhD from University of Wisconsin-Madison, graduated in 2008 um, and started teaching in University of South Carolina. I was an assistant professor in finance. Um, Of course, I still do a lot of research in real estate, so I spent 10 years in Columbia, South Carolina and joined UNC Charlotte uh, in 2018, and uh, at that time, I was uh, when I joined, I was the Trojan's Klein Distinguished Professor in Real Estate, and uh, starting from June 2020, I was I'm uh, the um, director of the Trojan's Klein Center for Real Estate, and the so set- you're a big wig now. You 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 got a title, you got a title. Yeah, I I got a title and. Um, with that title, there's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So Singapore to Wisconsin, how did that happen? Because I'm just wondering, is Singapore cold? Does it get cold in Singapore? No, it's always like uh, 90 something degrees. Okay. So the farthest north in the United States, well, I've been to New York and I've gone over to Canada, but generally speaking, I have cousins that live in Ohio. It's cold in Ohio. Yes. I'm pretty sure Wisconsin's even a little bit more north than Ohio. Mm-hmm. Why? Why not? Why is Wisconsin cold? I can, <laughs> I, can I can understand that on on the the global map, but generally speaking, why did you choose Wisconsin? So I wanted to get a PhD. Um, so um, USA is obviously the place to get a PhD because of all these great research universities. So I applied to a bunch of top universities and um, Wisconsin give me the best offer so I you used to make economics on that didn't you to figure out where you were uh, gonna go didn't you? yeah <laughs> and uh, they had uh, so they had uh, one of the best real estate programs in the country really yeah what what draws you to real estate like what because you said urban development is what you started with in China, yeah so, right? so the urban so this is kind of probably a little different system in China and uh, and US in in China kind of the real estate business is all almost always kind of development. So it's, so in that sense, it's part of planning or architecture department. So mm-hmm. that's where I'm from. But in the U S most of the time, uh, real estate is considered a, an asset class. So that's why most real estate programs are in the business school. So this is how I go from urban planning to real estate and then kind of finance real estate because in the U.S., real estate is an asset class, so it's very closely related to finance. 
I always said to myself, if I could choose, redo my career, so I'm a real estate attorney now, but if I ever could go back in time and choose, I'd probably want to be an architect. Did you want to be an architect at one point? Not really, because <laughs> I, I'm really poor at like the artistic side of, of things. So okay. if you ask me to draw a picture, I would say um, I'm even worse than my uh, eight-year-old son. So I'm not going to do it. I thought you were going to say math for a second. And I was going to say, that's I'm really nervous right now. <laughs> if, you're, if you're the head guy on all this stuff, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a little nervous. Let me move this stack of papers out of the way. We're going to come back to this. And by papers, I don't mean just pages. I mean, literally, you write papers as part of, of what you do. Uh, tell me real quick while I slip this under the desk, what, uh, what's your, what's your, of all the papers you've written or been a part of, mm -hmm. what's the one that's most memorable to you? Oh, uh, all right. So I'm going to say I'm mostly proud of the two papers that I'm actually currently working on. I published many papers, so uh, the two papers I'm currently working on is related to uh, mortgage lending discrimination. And uh, I try to um, understand kind of the financial forces behind uh, mortgage lending discrimination. So in the one paper, I'm looking at whether public bank or private bank are more likely to kind of discriminate, quote unquote. I'm not going to say this is not a legal term. It's data driven. Sure. So what I find is that uh, public banks uh, relative to private banks kind of actually uh, approve more mortgage applications from minority applicants relative to uh, private banks. So in this sense, uh, the capital markets or the pressure from the capital markets is a good thing in this case. So do, what, what would you mean by a private bank, right? So public, let's say Wells Fargo, right? Yes. What, what, give me an example of a private bank, like mom and pop, like, hey, I give out money on private lender or what's yes, the... So there are many banks that um, that are not public traded on major stock exchanges. So these are banks controlled by a small number of, uh, of owners, but sure. not, not publicly traded. So non-publicly traded banks is what yes. we're really referring to. So like a local, like a local bank that's in the town, yes. they give out loans, let's say to small business owners, they do some mortgages, right? Those kind of banks like that, then aren't your big publicly traded banks locally. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So what are you, what are you finding from your, from your data that you can share this? So I don't want to give, I don't want to give the spoiler away because people need to read yeah, your paper, so but. After a bank goes from private to public, the, the approval rates on minority applicants actually increases. Yeah. So uh, we kind of attribute to this as um, a um, profit maximization drive because uh, discrimination in its pure form, um, which we call taste-based, it is not trying to maximize profit. It's serving somebody's bias preference okay when a bank gets public traded now it's owned by shareholders so these all these dispersed shareholders are not going to share the same kind of bias what they really want if you're a shareholder of a bank you do not care who the bank lends money to the only thing they care is about maximizing profit. I need more money in my pocket is what yes. I need. So, Who's going to pay me? So this, in this case, maximizing profit is good, not only for the for like the shareholders, also for the borrowers. So in this case, the kind of there is a social benefit associated with this profit maximization um, uh, drive. So that that kind of makes people wonder because um that would make me wonder at least in general it does make me wonder the concept of that like all of wall street is discrimination right because that kind of goes against that model partially I, i'm not saying there's not segments of it right but partially speaking then being publicly traded being on wall street being a bank that answers to public shareholders holds them to a different standard maybe yes. almost okay yes, because they face all the pressures from their shareholders to maximize profit so because if you want to maximize profit you cannot like discriminate because that's not profit right. maximizing right 
you're Asian, you've got money, I'm white, I have some money, but if you've got more money, they, they're going to want your money more than they want mine, regardless of my race. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. That's, yeah. that, that seems logical, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I guess, are you investigating any bit of whether it's more of like at the kind of board level from a corporate culture down to, you know, individual managers kind of, is the paper taking any direction on that? Yeah, we do not have have a kind of uh, we do not have data at that level, um, but we do have some evidence that uh, for those kind of banks, if after they uh, went public, they're going to replace some mortgage officers in the areas that where there is a huge difference between the approval rates of minority and um, uh, white borrowers. Right. So, it looks like we do not know because we do not have uh, the data on each mortgage officer's uh, records. So right. We do not know whether these are really kind of discriminating uh, mortgage officers that get replaced. But we do see that the turnover of those mortgages at those locations actually increase. Interesting. Yeah. And and how does that? Uh, is it the numbers? Is it having that hard data that gets you excited about it, or or what is it that kind of is your driving force for wanting to? investigate these things so the, there there is a kind of very deep like theoretical drive for me to to study this because on the one hand um if you especially during the financial crisis so everybody is gonna say in the wall street is bad 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 right it, popular press would say and general public would say that but on the other hand, if you think about it, financial markets are very, very important, and crucial for for our economy. Um, and this is really important, and uh, the the academics would tend to say that there are a lot of benefits of financial markets. So think about it very simply. So if you are a future, let's say Mark Zuckerberg, mm-hmm. you've got a great idea, right, and but if you want to implement your idea, you need money. Mm-hmm. And you just do not have that money, let's say. I, I, they don't, won't take my Monopoly money anymore. They told me I'm not allowed to use that. So. <laughs> so you need to borrow, right? Where do you borrow? Right? So you can borrow with the financial markets. The first stop you can go, if you have a great idea, you can go to venture capital, right? So this happens what we call the primary market. So once your business to kind of grow, you can go IPO to raise money from the stock market. Okay, again, this is primary market. This is where whoever has money but does not have great ideas lend money to whoever has the greatest ideas and do not have money. So that's the primary market. And then, and then of course, think about um, a world where there's no secondary market. So people will often say, okay, I understand why primary market is necessary, right? I give money to people who has the greatest idea. If there's no secondary market, if you give money to Mark Zuckerberg, now it will probably take you like 10 to 20 years before Facebook is profit profitable and he can give, give, give money back, mm-hmm. all right? So now if that's the case, at the first place, I'm not going to give money, my money to Mark Zuckerberg because I cannot wait 20 years. Right. I don't have that much cash sitting around right now, Dr. Chu. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. So <laughs> so what happens is we need a secondary market where if I need my, my money back, I'm just going to sell my shares quickly. Mm-hmm. So that secondary market drives liquidity. So this is very important. The financial markets makes it possible for the money to flow to the most productive places. You mentioned primary and secondary markets. There's the concept of the secondary market of mortgages. Have you investigated and researched that component at all as it relates to the economics? Yeah, so the secondary mortgage market is, of course, also huge in the U.S. So actually, um, 70 to 80% of mortgages are owned, not by your mortgage lender. It's by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm-hmm. So this happens in, in the secondary mortgage market, right? So of course, one of the big problems of this in, in, in the US housing finance system where Fannie and Freddie is really huge, there, there's of course a lot of problems because 
at some point they're like too large to fail. So this is exactly happened during 2008, 2009 financial crisis. You can just not af- allow them to fail because this is the source of the whole housing market. If they fail in 2008, 2009, right? The house prices would have, I don't know. There'd be no value to a house at that point. I mean, yes, since if there's no debt, there's no... Nobody will be able to buy a house almost. Yeah. yeah. That relates to, do you think that that's a correlation to inflation or I, I guess how, how do those two components then come together? Or is there a connection then if we're talking about regulating prices, right? Like let's talk, take the Fed for instance, and let's say maybe if next week or any future meetings, they decide to raise the interest rate. Mm-hmm. And that is based on an assumption or theory mm-hmm. that... Uh, inflation is becoming out of control. How then do we, in the long term, given the current state of real estate, right? This is 2021. I think everyone and their mom wants to be in real estate, like from an investment perspective. So how how do we look at this from a long-term perspective then going forward? So I think at some point, Fed will have to... Uh to raise the interest rate. Sure. Free money can't be free forever. Come on now. Yeah. Not sure whether it's they're really trying to fight inflation because I think uh, the Fed still believes that most of the inflation is transitory. Mm. So um, think about like lumber price, cars. Uh, some of this is shortage caused by pandemic. Right. Yeah. So but microchips. Yeah, all that microchips stuff. because there is kind of... I tell you, Dr. Chu, if I learned anything in 2020, it's that everything has a microchip in it and nobody's got any microchips to sell right now. That's what I've learned over the past year. Yeah, I'm that's right. You. So that's why you can sell your car at a much higher price than you would. Yeah. Think, so, yeah. yeah. So some of that is, is transitory. Some of that is like supply chain disruptions because of the pandemic. And uh, if we can get out of this, I think... A lot of this will, will ease. However, I mean, the pace uh, at which the Fed is pumping money into this economy itself is not going to be sustainable. Right. So at some point, they will have to raise the interest rate. The CARES Act and the iterations that are that have followed suit, um, I don't even know, CARES Act 5 or whatever they're calling it these days, Um the money stopped yesterday, I believe, right? Labor Day, as far as for the additional federal checks, the cutoff date was yesterday. Do you think it's going to have a significant short-term impact, or you think it's more going to have to play out in the long term? Uh, so first of all, I think uh, the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve, and uh, the Treasury Department did a very good job of stabilizing everything at the onset of, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, be it uh, the Federal Reserve started uh, easing monetary policy, starting this unlimited QE program, and uh, buying back debt and all that. Uh, like buy, they were, the, yes, yeah, yeah, buying correct. all that, and then the the the, uh, the federal government uh, offering all these assistance or CARES Act, all, all those funding, pumping those uh, uh, money into the economy. However, I think. Um, at some point, it will have to stop. So we've already seen some kind of the effect. Some of the labor shortage is is caused by uh, those very generous unemployment benefit. Yeah. Right. So if you get like a thousand dollars per per month from from somebody and you do not need to work, sure. And then if you can, if you are offered a like twelve hundred dollar per month job, you're not going to take it. Right. So, I'm going to sit on the couch in my skibbies and watch my shows all day long is what I'm going to do, Dr. Yeah, Chu. We wouldn't be having this conversation right now, yeah, I'll tell you so, that. So, so and, uh, and at the end of the day, you need people to work, to, to produce, to, 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 for the economy to recover. So I think at some point it will have to stop. Um, but um, given the severity of the Delta variant and, of course, depending on how business react to it, um, I don't know, um, it might be necessary to extend it, but I don't think this is going to be a long-term solution. I was very nervous as a real estate attorney when the pandemic first hit because, um, and my dad was in real estate as I grew up. So my family's been in real estate. I'm kind of like a second generation real estate guy. And he started off as a mortgage lender and a real estate broker in California. Then we moved out here to North Carolina, just focused on being a broker. So uh, my family has experienced those 
directly sector real estate related ups and downs, right? The mid nineties crash and then the 2008 crash were very real for my family. And it, I, I, I got a bit nervous with the pandemic because I wondered, man, is this going to be another 2008 for real estate? Because things were looking very good. You look at 2019, um, even since, since 2012, realistically, right? North Carolina has just been on an upward tra trajectory. There's no denying that. Yes. Um, and I got a little nervous and, but what happened with real estate is because the practical side of it was everyone got locked indoors, right? To say yeah. it in a simplistic way. Well, if I'm going to get locked indoors, I need a bigger house is what people started saying. Right. Yes. And, and I think there were a lot of sectors that while a, an unfortunate side effect, of course, for anybody was the loss of jobs, right? Like nobody yeah. wants to lose their job for yes. of no fault of their own. Yeah. But a lot of, companies and sectors in particular, let's take even banking, for instance, since we're talking about North Carolina, right? We're able to pivot to an at-home model for a lot of people. Technology these days makes it relatively easy, right? Mm -hmm. There was enough capital reserves to start spending some money on that, even yeah. if you allow your employees to use you know, their own devices, certain policies, things like that, to where there wasn't really a misstep, I almost feel like, for a significant portion of people as it relates to income, do do you know of any data that I'm missing on that or your thoughts on that? Because to me, it's very sector specific, right, is where I think the, the results came from, from a loss of income mm -hmm. related to the job, not health, the job. Am I wrong on that, on that thinking? They there are a lot of people lost jobs uh, at at least at the onset of uh, of of the pandemic, and we are still not getting back all the right. jobs lost. Um, but uh, one thing, so this is, so I had also kind of the fear that the the real estate market may get a huge hit at the onset of the pandemic. But one thing that's very different. Um, like before this pandemic compared to 2006, 2007 is the leverage is much, was much lower mm. this time yeah, because of uh, all the things that uh, we did after, after 2008, 2009. Yeah. So you mean from a regulatory perspective on, from, on the willingness to give a loan? Yeah. From regulatory perspective. So the, the households are not, very highly leveraged, if, especially uh, in terms of mortgages. Right. So, um, and as you said, the demand kept rising because, uh, so let's say nationally, more generally, everybody wants to have a bigger house. So if you have, if you have to work from home, if you have two kids that needs to take Zoom classes. All day. All day. <laughs> and... You need you need a bigger house, so yeah. that's why there is kind of strong demand. And then in this region, in Charlotte or North Carolina, more generally, there are also people moving from outside. So people moving from New York because yeah, yeah well, we are working from home. Why I'm paying like double or triple the price to stuck in a like half the size of the house I can afford in the tax difference too. Sure, sure. the annual yeah. property tax bills are huge difference for people. Yeah. Here. So that's why we are seeing in general, the prices in most metro areas increase and in Charlotte in particular. Yeah. So I guess the question becomes and the, and the concern for a lot of people, cause, cause I don't, I, and I'll be honest with you. I don't live in the city of Charlotte. Um, I don't, I don't live in an unco unincorporated part of Charlotte. I live in one of the surrounding towns that is incorporated, but is within Mecklenburg County. Mm -hmm. I live in one of what, what I like to call one of the two lane towns, right? So it's, it's a, it's a decent sized town in the, in the amount of square miles. But as far as infrastructure goes, right, you could drive through my entire town within one or two roads. And that just is what it is, uh, from a geography perspective. But people's concern right now locally seems to be density. And a lot of people are moving here because it's a great place to live. Yes. If it's not a great place to live, people wouldn't want to move here. And you know, I'd probably be looking to leave, right? Let's be yeah. honest. But um, I told my wife to go and bury me in the backyard, so that's okay. Um, but people are moving here, and everyone wants to know how much is too much. 
So I, I think uh, for Charlotte, um, it's still okay. I mean, if you compare to those large cities, New York, Chicago, LA of the world, Charlotte is much, much better. Yeah. And of course, at the end of the day, it's going to be a, there, there will be a balance. So, but one thing I want to emphasize is it's, I think we are not kind of at the point where we need to worry too much about density because once you start to worry about density, especially when local residents start to worry about density, then we will have this NIMBY problem, which which is going to cause uh, a lot of problem in the housing market because um, my understanding of the housing, the affordable housing kind of problem. So at the end of the day, all the affordable housing problem or housing problem is a supply problem. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to build many houses as we want, there won't be a affordability issue. There won't be a housing problem. We can build enough houses. But the problem is in most places I can understand is there are lots of kind of restrictions regardless who imposed those restrictions on new constructions on increasing housing supply. Mm -hmm. And once we start to worry about worrying about density, worrying about all those kind of things, then we will see more restrictions mm -hmm. on on housing supply. And that will just push the house prices higher. Higher and higher. So this is something we do not want to see. So and of course, we also do not want to see that, okay, we do not want to see density. We do not want to see higher price. What we do, we just keep everybody out. Mm. So this is what happened to the Amazon headquarters too. Right. Right. So for me, that was a great opportunity for that area, but. At what There's, cost? That that there was just strong opposition from local residents. Yep. So, so I think Charlotte has been like welcoming new businesses. If you read the news, the, I mean, every week we it seems that some some business are relocating to this region. It's crazy. I mean, the amount of businesses in major core and, and not just Charlotte, right? But the surrounding proximity yeah. to Charlotte is nuts. Yeah. So we should be welcoming those business because this is just going to make the, the this area better that's right but of course what they're gonna when they come they're gonna bring a lot of people and a lot of those are very high paying jobs so um and then if if that is the case if we are not going to be able to build more more houses the prices are going to be higher and higher okay so with high paying job, no supply, it's going to drive up the prices even from the lower end. Oh, yeah. So that will make like real, the real low income people yeah. suffer even more. Yep. So the only way to solve this problem is to m make new construction easier. And that's a, it's a general, general concept of like you're saying, supply and demand. I, I remember when I, when, when my wife and I first started looking for a house in uh, 2012, thankfully, I mean, and, and by the way, the secret to real estate, you make money when you buy, not when you sell. That's, that's what I, I wish people would grasp that concept. Um, but when we were started looking, you know, the, the average price we were looking at was like, you know, m low mid ones, right? Because she was a teacher. Uh, I'm broke in law school, right? So we're, we're basically using her income. We're trying to find out how to live. And we had a couple options. Mm -hmm. But in the market right now that I'm seeing as a closing attorney, if you're not north, I'm going to say 300. If you're not north of 300 right now, y you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle to find something. You're going to have to make some compromises you didn't think you were going to have to make if you want to buy and you have to balance that with, do I keep renting? Because not everyone has to buy a house, right? I'm not going to say right. everyone has to buy. But some people that are thinking to the future and want to be part of what we quote unquote say is the American dream, right? Mm -hmm. Of owning real estate and building uh, multi-generational wealth, real estate being one of those number one tools. How do we do that if you have to 
pay north of 300 for a house but don't have a job that matches that qualification yeah so that's that's gonna be a, a big problem so the thing you talked about we uh we saw this exactly using uh in our last report so i i the exact number might not uh, be accurate but so for like back in uh 2012 like the percent of houses sold for less than 150 was like 40 percent in this area oh wow and 2019 that number is like 12 percent 12 percent with it a significantly increase of demand to where that 12 percent yeah is getting smaller and smaller yeah. Yeah. as the days go yeah and then uh, so we have not kind of complete analyzed the, the most recent data I, I think that number is even smaller I would believe it. it's changing daily, which is the crazy yes. part. Yes. It's, I think that's that's the that's the part that has me a little nervous now. I, I won't I won't say I'm nervous about a bubble, right? I'm, I'm not at, in this exact moment. I'm not nervous about a bubble, um, and I and I say that relative to North Carolina. Um, there may be some areas in the country, right, that are already starting to feel some effects, right, as depopulation happens, as people are yeah. leaving um, North Carolina with its increase of jobs and um, quality of life, right, yes. I, I would say overall yeah. for North Carolina. I mean, hey, four hours from here, I can be at the beach or I can be at the mountains. So I completely agree with you. I do not see a bubble. I mean, the, the prices are mostly uh, demand driven, real demand driven. Um, there, there are of course many factors. So um, people wants to have a bigger house during the pandemic and uh, people moving from outside the state and the economy here is strong and businesses are moving in and uh, the interest rate being low of course helps a lot and then during the pandemic, there is a little bit supply side, lumber cost is was really high. So all these things contribute to the to the like very dramatic increase in price. I would not kind of predicted that th this kind of <laughs> increase in price. No. Given that said, I still don't think this is this is bubble. This is very real demand driven. So uh, going forward, I think uh, the kind of the pace at which the price increased will probably slow down. But I do not see the price will decrease. Yeah. The slowdown, I think, has come from the inventory that's available at this point. Buyers are now saying this as, well, wait a second. Like, I get paying higher, right? Yeah. But what these people are asking for is just crazy at this point. And I don't want to be that emotional, right? Because yeah. it's emotional. Yes. I don't want to be sucked into the emotionalness of this and make a decision that is going to haunt me the rest of my life. Yeah. I think that's a lot of people's concern. Yeah. Um, and you brought up Amazon, which I, I found that's that situation was so fascinating to me. And along with Apple, right? Like both of those were so fascinating to me. When if you look at it now, Amazon is planting distribution facilities in the North Carolina area all over. Yes. And, and, and so in my mind, your, your workers, right? Your actual laborers, we're having a significant increase of that because transportation supply chain, right? Like that's what a lot of areas of Charlotte surround Concord, right? If you look at Concord, you look at Charlotte near the airport, near you've got the, the highway system of 40, 85, 77, that really is a great connector for the entire East Coast. Mm -hmm. They see something here that regardless of the flair of corporateness, mm -hmm. there's a reason why they're having their day-to-day -day operations in our area. Yeah, this is just a great area to to live, to do business, and the transportation is very convenient for everybody. So, define affordable housing for me. So we would generally consider if you if a household spent less than thirty percent of your pre tax gross gross income, then it will consider housing is affordable. What, what would you say, because you then, if, okay, so if it's 30% of pre-tax income, yeah, you've got to know the average income of a potential area too. Off the top of your head, yeah. what are we looking at at that number? Ballpark. So, in, so uh, usually we would say the median income, uh, median household income, I think it's around 50,000 to 60,000 in this area. Okay. 
So 30%, so let me do some quick, and do, or give me the math, you're the math guy, tell yeah, me yeah. what's the yeah, math. So 30% of that is, is going to be 15,000 to 18,000 range. Okay. So if you divide it by 12, you get a monthly of, uh, uh, 1200 bucks, somewhere 12, like that, somewhere yeah, 12, in that range. 1200, yeah, 1200 range. So, Dr. Chu, where can you rent some for 1200 bucks in Charlotte? Uh, so if I got two kids, I got two kids at the house, 1200 bucks a month. Where am I living? You do not have many good choices. I'm calling mama and daddy, and I'm moving back in the bedroom, is what's happening, yeah, Dr. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do not have so we actually have some numbers showing that uh, the percent of uh, apartments um, less than $1,000 is also decreasing very fast in this area. Yeah. Yeah. And um, during the pandemic, I, knew, I mean, 1200 is very tough. Yeah. At the, I mean, that's almost unrealistic in certain parts. You're having to, again, people are having to compromise on things they never thought they'd have to compromise on from a housing perspective yes. to be able to afford. Yes. And it brings up an interesting concept to me of the baby boomer, baby boomer generation as they're looking to retire mm -hmm. and this concept of accessory dwelling units. What are your thoughts on this? Do you have any thoughts on that concept of being able to do, build multiple structures on one parcel to make it multi-generational? Uh, honestly, I have not seen many uh, kind of this kind of concepts, but I don't know. But, but think about I, I just do not like the idea of multi-generation live together it's too close yeah it's close but too close is that what it, like <laughs> yeah. like we don't need to have thanksgiving every day <laughs> concept or what yeah, like that's yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, i'm not sure so even if in, in theory it might be able to solve some problem i i i'm not sure how people really mentally will, will be able will, to live want to want want <laughs> yeah. that Right. You're talking about because somebody's living with an in-law. One of the two is living with an in-law. Is that the problem that we're talking about here? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, of course, during the last kind of decades, we probably see more like adult adult kids living with their parents. But yeah. I think long term, this should not be a solution. Okay. Well, I didn't mean in the same house, right? Like an accessory dwelling is detached. You just share a yard. You know what I mean? Like you can step <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, you know, they can always come and and yell at you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Chu's worried about getting yelled at by his mommy. I get it. I understand. No, that's okay. Um, so what do you think then? Uh, what What's the solution? What, what, are, what are the options, right? There's not going to be, we're, some of it's we're not going to know until we test it out, right? Like, I think that that's fair to say. What, what do you think are some of the potential solutions? Is it just free for all, let them build? Or is it, uh, how do you balance it? Yeah, so I think make development, uh, construction uh, less costly, easier is at the end of the day is the solution. Of course, there's always going to be trade-offs, right? So um, if you want more construction, more development, you will have higher density, mm -hmm. right? You may also lose some of the green space um, you enjoy. Yeah. Um, so I think this is some kind of things people will have to have to think about if you want growth, if you want to see a kind of more prosperous city, this is the cost that we need to pay. Right. Otherwise, people are just not going to come. And uh, this is not, I, I don't think that's going to be something the Charlotte region wants to have, right? We want to grow. Yeah. And it's, we are on a very good path. And uh, I don't want uh, housing to be the, the roadblock to Right. That growth. Right. No, so, nobody wants that. Yeah. So we wanted to have to like make the reasonable compromise in terms of density, green space, all those kind of things to make development a little easier. There's an interesting bill that's on the, I don't know, the floor or the table, whatever you want to call it at the state level in North Carolina. I read the other day. The general gist I got from this bill, both of there's a Senate bill and a House bill. If a property is zoned single family, mm -hmm. a local governing body cannot stop someone from building up to, I believe, a triplex mm -hmm. 
on the parcel. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with this legislation? I, okay. I don't. What are your thoughts that on duplexes and triplexes, both from a building perspective and um, any effects on the community, I guess, too? Any thoughts on that? Multifamily. I, so I do not have any problem with that. So the the at the end of the day, it's, so let's say you're a developer and you have a, a piece of land. You decide what you want to do, right? So if you think there's enough demand for that, and obviously, hopefully... I think uh, we know the answer to that one, Dr. Chu. There's enough demand. If there is <laughs> enough demand for those kind of structure, go build it. Yeah. But of course, there's always going to be like considerations, for example, from the developer's perspective, I'm developing the whole neighborhood, right? Yeah. Um, if I'm building all single family, what is going to be my total revenue from right. that? If I stuck in two or three duplex or triplex, of course, you're not going to just considering these duplexes. Right. You're, you also need to consider how that's going to impact the prices of other houses you're going to sell. Right. So that's going to be... Uh, so if, if the developer is doing this calculation, I have no problem with that as long as it can increase the total housing space. That's completely fine. What do you think about the fact... And, and this is getting... And if it's it's too far, you tell me. What do you, what do you think about the concept of the state dictating that a local governing body has no control. I guess what are your any thoughts on that component of it? So I so I, I'm not sure how what do you say by it has no control as long as the state does not force a developer to say in this neighborhood or e every neighborhood will have a certain percentage of duplex or triplex. I'm fine. So I, for me is you just let developers to make their decision of whether I'm going to develop a single family, whether I'm going to develop a duplex, triple, triplex. I think I, I would consider that as deregulation. Oh, I agree with you. It's definitely deregulation. There's yeah. no doubt about that yeah. for sure. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm completely fine with that. Okay. What are your thoughts on um, a lot of the local municipalities and, and even, you know, the bigger cities, city of Charlotte and stuff, tree save components, right, are a big topic of it and the cost associated with that? Because a lot of it, it comes down to as well, erosion control is what they call it, right? So creating like retention ponds, you know, like when you go through an apartment complex, there's the giant pond and it's basically because of water runoff is where things have to go. When you factor in those type of development costs into a scenario, do you think that there's a way, and if you're, if you're not familiar with it, then, then no, no shame in that. I'm just wondering, is there a way to couple community with density? Does that make sense? Like you want to have a balance, right? Because we need we need some geography that has commercial. We need some geography that has residential. Is there a number that cuts it off? Like what 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 do you think the maximum population of North Carolina could be one day that you'd see in your lifetime? What do you think the max the population will be like when you die in North Carolina? I don't know. So <laughs> I, I, I I come from China, so for me. We're nowhere close. We're not even. We're not even close. <laughs> yeah. So, but but uh, the housing scenario here and there yeah. is is very 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 different. Sure. Uh, at the end of the day, so if if you think about those kind of extreme cases, then it will involve like the change of your lifestyle. Yeah. I, I don't think that will happen in my lifetime here in in the U.S. So I'm I I, I don't worry about that. Yeah. Do you, in China, educate me on the, is it, is it mostly like condos that people buy? Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, and so a lot of people buy the condos or is it yeah, rentals or kind of? most, uh, a lot of people will have to buy, of course, given the cost, a lot of people are, are like, um, renting, but in China, if you like, um, if you want to get married, you better, you better buy, buy a condo. Otherwise, no girls will want to marry you. So. Oh, so you gotta get you gotta have the goods to get married in China. Oh, yeah, huh? oh yeah. so, I'm learning. Okay. Yeah. So in China now, it's like, so because China had this one child policy, right? right? So for let's say a a couple of at their thirties or late twenties, they want they want to get married. 
what they're going to do is they're going to pull all the financial resources from the four parents. Yeah. So to make um, it affordable for them to actually make make it possible for them to even just to pay the down payment. Wow. Yeah. That's family though. That's good. Yeah. But you don't want an accessory to them with them living in the same yard though, right? Like that's no. Sometimes (laughs) it's, it's, yeah, they don't. Yeah. It's just contributing financial resources. But this is, I don't know, but uh, compared to a lot of the large cities in, in China, I don't think the housing is that is not that unaffordable here yeah. uh, at this point, at least. Let's talk about uh, switch gears for, for a second. And, and so you say, um, you know, the 30% of your income being that general threshold when we talk about affordable housing. Um, there's the component that's that the conversation is continuing to increase, as it should, about homelessness. And I, I will say, while there is homelessness that occurs in Charlotte and the surrounding areas, I'm not blind to the fact that there's homelessness. Compared to some cities, Charlotte's doing okay as it relates to the amount of population that's homeless. Now, let me preface that with even one homeless person is not okay, right? Like, let me say that generally speaking. I, nobody should have to be homeless at all. Yep. But if we compare Charlotte to other cities, mm-hmm. do you think, um, relatively speaking, is it is it purely based on a population comparison, right? Because if you take New York or the general population of New York, are we about the same? Do you think, from a homelessness perspective, I think as we them? have fewer, fewer? Do you what do you think then about the model that exists of housing first? What do you have any thoughts on that um, to combat homelessness from an economic perspective at all, or? So first of all, I think um, homelessness is not, strictly speaking, is not really a housing problem, right? So um, it's it's a more broader social economic problem. So I think just fighting homelessness just from the housing perspective is probably not going to be able to solve the problem for you you know you're in the minority on that opinion i would assume right or no am i wrong about that or do you feel like you're in the minority on that opinion i don't know yeah so <laughs> you're just speaking truth right now which is i appreciate yeah, so. <laughs> so yeah so that's yeah i, I need to be careful on that one but no and right. i and, and i say that not because i disagree with you so i am also on the board of a local nonprofit mm-hmm. transitional homeless shelter the hope house which is yeah. in huntersville we believe in the model of supportive services. Yes. And so basically the general model is the current home we have allows for six families to come in. We bring those six families in, wrap around services for six months, give these people a hand up, not a hand out, try to teach them life skills, come alongside of them to help themselves raise their own bar transition them to some transitional housing. We're building some cottages right now, that sort of thing. And then they get a little bit of independence. Then after that, we help them get the permanent housing piece, whether that be renting or purchasing up to them, their life decision where it takes them at that point. But starting with the support of services, I got to tell you from my own eyes and my own experience and some of the professionals that are actually practically working with homeless people on a day-to-day basis, the housing housing first model doesn't work. I'm going to just be honest because you put people in a house that have no skills. What is it really solving? Because anybody can build a house, right? Like, I mean, yes. hey, I, I mean, legally, if I buy a piece of land, if I'm going to make it my primary residence, Dr. Chu, I can build a house. You don't want me building that house, Dr. Chu. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not a general contractor, but yeah. I could. But again, my point being building houses isn't the solution. Coming alongside people and getting people motivated that's to right. better themselves seems like a better economical solution. Is that yes, that's say? that's exactly what I mean. It's not really a housing problem, or you you probably won't be able to solve this problem just by providing housing. Yeah, it's an interesting component, right? Because everybody wants to. I think everybody wants to get them off the street, right? Almost gonna. Yes. Sound, and, I, and when I say them again, I mean no disrespect. I don't mean it that way. I'm just I'm just talking in the colloquial terms to kind of set the conversation, but people want to get homeless people off the street. If we, if we hide them, then there's not really a problem to be seen. And I think that that's the mentality that we have right now. Yeah. You, I mean, it's, 
I mean, you can't hide them, but the problem is still going to be there. Right. Right. So um, I think at the end of the day, as what you said, the kind of work you are doing is uh, housing can be just only very small part of it. You got to teach them skills, teach them financial responsibility, teach them how to make the, the right life decisions that will get them on their own feet and then. Yeah, start building up. You seem like a cool guy. You like, you like cheeseburgers? I'm a big cheeseburger guy, Doctor Chu. We should get a cheeseburger sometime together. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Doctor Chu. What What do you want people to know? Because you're in the know on this. You You're on the forefront. Yeah, like I said, everyone's got your card for the dance right now. What do you What do you want people to know about housing right now? So, again, this is gonna go back to what I have already said so at the end of the day so if we want to kind of mitigate or solve this housing affordability issue that everybody needs to make compromise right so you need to you you we should be getting ready to see more density we should be getting ready to sacrifice a little bit of green space um and then to make development a lot easier and uh, to really trying to solve this, uh, this uh, um, NIMBY problem. Uh, so at the end of the day, new construction, new supply of housing is going to be the key to solve the problem. In areas where populations increasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. And yeah. So when I say this is, this is really just, because North Carolina is not going to stop. I mean, I don't. I, yeah. I'm short of some crazy decision coming out that plummets the economy in North Carolina, which we certainly hope our state legislators are in the know and are going to make the smart choices for yeah, for the we, betterment of North Carolina. If we introduce some stupid bills, then that what happens happen. every once in a while. <laughs> 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 but you know, it is what it is. So, well, I really appreciate your time. Um, if people wanted to to get, can I take a class with you? Who can take a class with you? You have to be a UNCC full time student. Are you teaching these days? Tell me what you're up to. So, uh, I teach. So, but this semester I'm, I do not have teaching. Uh, I teach uh, usually in the spring semester. Okay. So I teach uh, the real estate capital markets, and if it's in person, it's usually uh, in the in our uh, center city building. This it's called Dubois Center now. So so uh, capital markets is the course it's itself. The real estate capital markets. Okay. It's the course. Yeah. So that's your pet. That's what you like teaching that one. Do you get to pick which one you teach, or do they make you teach that one? Uh, kind of. They make me teach that one, but I, I nowadays I have a lot of freedom to choose what I wanted to. But I like teaching that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like teaching or researching more? Uh, so the most correct way to answer is I like both. Okay. Uh, the true answer is I like research more. <laughs> okay. No, that's fair. <laughs> that's okay. Hey, you're a brilliant person. They sh You should be able to spend your time doing what you want. So this stack of papers, what if somebody wanted to read all of these gems right here can they do you have somewhere that they can go and pull all your papers and and find it so they should be able to find most of my papers from my personal web page and uh and where they will have links to um um to a website called sssrn social social science research network so i have uh, most of my papers there and uh, for published papers, it's kind of tricky because uh, the publishers will have restricted access. But I think from my SSRN, you should have, you should be able to access most of the working paper versions of the published papers. So they're, they're similar. Yeah, they're there. They're there. Dr. Chu's been with us. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate your time. Justin Kazepis, todaysrealtalk.com, todaysrealtalk.com, todaysrealtalk.com. We'll see you next time. Thank you.